to our uh, panel this evening. I know you guys have been uh, drinking from the fire hose with a lot of information, but we're going to try and bring a lot of it all together today with a, a panel on machine learning, experimentation, and causal in inference all, all together. And we have uh, four of the, the world's experts up here. There's fire. We also have a, a, a fire. <laughs> Really this is a fireside, a digital fire, of course. <laughs> exactly. So uh, you all know uh, Susan, Leon, Ben, and Don. And uh, I, I want to dive right in. I think it'd be useful. We were, we were talking about this a little bit on the phone the other day. And uh, we realized that we weren't all in sync with even just what these words meant. So I'm going to just jump around here and ask the panelists to help us define what machine learning experimentation and causal inference are. And then from that, we should be able to, to progress. So let's start with, I, what, Ben, why don't you tell us what your understanding of machine learning is? Sure. And we'll, and maybe we'll see if, if people agree. Sure. So in my view, I think uh, machine learning is really part of modern statistics. It's a natural progression from features, genetic randomization, now we hear a lot about, to the modern world with a lot of data from I information technology, and I look at the Wikipedia page, it says it's part of computer science. So I think it's probably both right. I'm coming from statistics, and it's like closely related to computational statistics. I think it's actually, it's part of that same thing, just two uh, different words. And, but the difference between machine learning and classical statistics actually takes computation much, much uh, seriously, and often starts from computation. But I don't think machine learning is panacea. It has actually still assumptions. One big assumption used is like, all oh, the units are exchangeable. And often that's not the case. There's a lot of heterogeneity you have to tackle up front. Another kind of warning is that cross-validation is great, but it doesn't work all the time. And it's not the real prediction error. It's actually estimated prediction error often has pretty high estimation error. So on that, um, I call myself statistician, probably also a machine learner. Okay, very good. Well, we'll get into that more. We, now we need to define experimentation. I'm going to pick on you, Leon, to, uh, yeah, to yeah. tell us what, what you can maybe give us some you examples. Want me, and I thought about the definition, but the sentence is what? I said it's collecting data in such a way that all confounding variables are accounted for, and you can use the statistical information to infer causation. That's a high bar. I, so has anyone ever done an experiment? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, a, a randomized experiment is quite okay. good because yeah. when something is randomized, yeah. you know it's not confounded because the okay. cause is your dice, it's not anything else. Okay. So but to, but my definition is very dry, so maybe I should uh, comment. Well, give us an example. I you may, have, you may have done one or two. I should first, first define confounding because it's, it's actually a difficult, it's, it's probably the difficult concept. Mm -hmm. So I say that if I have A and B, two variables, and I want to know whether changing A will change B. And I observe some uh, statistical dependency, let's say correlation between A and B to be simple. Mm -hmm. uh, if I believe Reichenbach, it means that A and B have common causes. Now the common cause could be, if they don't contain A, changing A is not going to do anything. Mm -hmm. If they contain A only, changing A is going to do what the correlation says. If they contain A and other things, then all bets are off. Mm -hmm. Other things are the confounding variable. Mm -hmm. If I know the confounding variables, I can use stratification and just con condition on the confounding variables say whether changing A is going to change B. If I don't know them, being there are confounding variables that are unknown or just non-measured or I have no idea what they could be, all bets are off. So uh, if you want to collect data in such a way that the confounding variables are accounted for, there are several solutions. One of them is to randomize explicitly Mm -hmm. if, if you randomize explicitly, the only cause is your throw of the dice, mm -hmm. and there cannot be other causes. Mm -hmm. uh, another way is to uh, the think about all the possible confounding variables, categorize them smartly, and try to invent a credible story explaining why you don't need to care about these or those. Mm -hmm. And uh, from that approach, you get a lot of other approaches, like IV approaches or like uh, natural experiments. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, well. Well, it's great. I think we're going to have to come back to those, especially the randomization, but the other one, maybe some of the other methods as well. So, Don, I have to go to you for defining uh, causality. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the, uh, the only way to define it easily is to think that really it's, it's all causal questions, uh, all causal 
causal inference questions at least, are missing data questions. You have what you observe something and you'd like to know if I had gone back in the past and done something else, what would I now see? And so it's a comparison of something that you can see with something that you can't see. And uh, therefore, and, and, and does it have to be a, a person involved? You know? Not necessarily. So when you say I, yeah. that you mean, yeah. No, no. <laughs> Um, it's, it's, it's easier to, to use those words rather than, than what the investigator or some, uh, okay. something like that. But it, uh, you're trying to, so you can say things, for example, that are totally impossible to, to do, but you could hypothetically think, think about it. Uh, for example, the, the sun causes the planets to go in their orbits. So that, that's, a, that's a statement that no matter how I went back and got rid of the sun, if I exploded it somehow or sent missiles at it, if I got rid of the sun, the planets would no longer go in their orbits. Okay, that's a expensive experiment. <laughs> Very. <laughs> so, so Susan, you get to you get to bring it all. Why do we have all these people on the same panel? Why are we all here talking about the, these issues? I think there's yep. a couple of kind of interesting themes when you try to bring all this together. I mean, one thing that I noticed in working in tech firms was this dichotomy that you have all these people working on predictive machine learning models, like machi machine learning models that predict clicks or machine learning models that, you know, there's a combination of hundreds of machine learning models going into a search engine. And in some sense, everybody there deals with causality every day because if you're an engineer, you don't get your bonus unless you ship your algorithm and you don't ship your algorithm unless it goes through an A-B testing platform. And everybody understands the purpose of this A-B testing platform is to test whether your algorithm is better than something else. Mm -hmm. So that's like the gold standard for causal inference. But I think what's kind of missing when I see inside tech firms is kind of the, the middle ground in between sort of those two extremes. For example, our last panel this afternoon was about natural experiments mm -hmm. and using observational data or sort of imperfect data or data that didn't come from a purely randomized experiment mm -hmm. to draw conclusions. And so in some sense, that middle ground is missing. And then you see that, that sort of uh, come up, the, the implications of that, of that disconnect uh, in all sorts of ways. So one is that we haven't seen, and we're just now beginning to see the, the importation of a lot of machine learning techniques, which are very systematic about <coughs> exploring data for causal inference, and that's something that I'm working on. Mm -hmm. But also, there's in some ways a lack of exportation of something like instrumental variables into a machine learning algorithm. And just to get back to sort of the causal versus machine learning thing, click prediction is like one of the most valuable machine learning algorithms out there. You're predicting clicks for, and that, and, and for Google or for Bing, and that's the most important algorithm from a money perspective. Mm -hmm. But so what, it, what does a click prediction algorithm do? Well, in fact, what it does is it takes an ad and it says counterfactually, how many clicks would it get if it was in the first position? Mm -hmm. And most of the ads have never been seen in the first position, and it no, certainly not on that query. So this is something that Leon worked on a lot as well. We, we talked about a lot when we were both working with Microsoft Bing Ads data. So that there was a deficiency in the, the world's most valuable machine learning algorithm because the people who built it didn't fully think about the problem as a problem to do counterfactual prediction and also therefore didn't bring in some of the techniques like instrumental variables and so on that could help you figure out what in your data would help you make better predictions and what works. And so just the algorithms, for example, might not fully account for the fact that an ad tended to be shown in the top position if, if it was a very good match for the user based on user characteristics and so they, they were overestimating mm -hmm. the effect of position in that algorithm and thus leaving, leaving revenue on the table. And so by understanding the, the, the fact that this is an algorithm to do a counterfactual prediction, that you want to get causal predictions, and therefore by using experimental data or other techniques, you could actually get better estimates, um, not, from a, not judged just from a pure prediction standpoint, but from a counterfactual standpoint. Um, you, 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 you're leaving money on the table. So they're thinking of this as a prediction problem, but you're saying ultimately it's, it really should be thought of more as a causal inference problem. Exactly, and to mm -hmm. test it, you would really need to see what happened if I re-ranked ads in a different way mm -hmm. uh, relative to the way that my prediction algorithm is doing. So just purely matching the data under the current algorithm is not good enough. You want to know what would happen if I changed the way that I showed ads and, 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 and found mm -hmm. a better way to get mm -hmm. the right ads in the top position. Leon? And there are actually two things I would like to say. 
Uh, in machine learning, there is a subfield called reinforcement learning that deals with causation without really saying it. It's quite amusing to see that it exists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the second one is something like the ads and the... Do you want to say, do you want to say a, a, a word, you kind of intrigued us there, but with the reinforcement learning has gotten very popular in, in some areas. You want to just map it for the rest of us, how that oh, is dealing with causality? Reinforcement learning are techniques that when you have a machine learning agent mm -hmm. that's in interaction with some environment, Mm -hmm. And there is a recent uh, paper that was quite mm, uh, famous uh, about from DeepMind about the machine learning agent able to learn how to play video games by right. just seeing Be the pixels. Right, space invaders, etc. Space invaders and everything, which is sort of amusing. Uh, about 20 years ago, there was a system of the same kind mm -hmm. learning to play backgammon, mm -hmm. which is a bit simpler because there is randomization built in because of the, of the dice. Mm -hmm. But conceptually, it's in the same category and there and during all these 20 years, there were people working on this kind of problem. Now, the second part is something like a, a, a website, or let's say a click prediction. Uh, if you intervene by changing the click prediction system, you're going to change the distribution of all the variables in ways that can be complex. And you have two ways to deal with it. One is to anticipate the change of the distribution by using essentially causal inference techniques. Uh, the other one is to try to do your predictor in a way that's robust to this change up to a certain limit. And the second one is uh, uh, not, not, not much has been written about it, but it's pretty powerful. Okay. Yeah. Then, and I, actually, I want to say, if you're interested in asking questions to the panelists, you can start coming up to the, to the microphones, and we'll jump in with audience questions as well. But go ahead, Ben. I just want to make a connection back to more classical statistics. Like, I think there's a field called sequential design. Yeah, of course, yeah. And the band is, so that's kind of enforcement learning with the new machine learning name, but it's very much the same intellectual route and yeah. the more recent development. L let's go, so more basically, are there places where machine learning without worrying too much about causality can be very effective? I mean, because we just heard some that it was not so effective. Yes? I have an example. Yeah. You want to recognize zip codes. Recognize zip codes. Zip codes to make machines to solve the mail, the paper mail. You mean like reading the digits? Reading the digits. Yeah. Well, if you install your machine, you're probably not going to change the distribution of the digit or the distribution of letters. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you're not going to have a covariate shift. Okay. And that's going to work. Don, you have, what are your thoughts about whether, whether we need to worry about causal inferences? Is there, is there, how important are problems where we don't care about causal inference? Is, is, there, is that the null set? No, uh, certainly not. And there, are, uh, there are whole classes of problems where uh, they're couched in, in causality or retributable risk, things like that. And the real issues are, are not causal ones. I'm thinking legal contexts, where sort of the judges get to decide or statutes get to decide what you can condition on. And, and the issues of confounding is, is not the issues that, that, that Ian was talking about. Because there, there are issues where the, the court decides what variables you can and what variables you, you, you must condition on. And, and they're not making the decisions based on anything intelligent at least intelligent scientifically. <laughs> Maybe intelligent legally, but a lot of the uh, tobacco litigation is like that. Would you say on balance that causal inference is, is overrated, underrated, that we need to pay, you know, is this something we need to, to be thinking more about or is it, is it something that, that people are obsessing about unnecessarily? Well, in my experience, and I think uh, we all probably have somewhat different experiences, that uh, in, in uh, one class of problems, it's probably un, uh, overrated, not overrated. It's <coughs> it's not utilized enough with okay. with with, with uh, uh, careful thought. And in others uh, examples, I can think of, it's it's used like this. This attributable risk risk language is used all, all the time, and I think it's it's largely silly because it's, it's sort of getting at causality, but but not really. They're just you know, a lot of the work on pollution and and the effects of air pollution. I think is like that as well as the stuff on tobacco. The effects on pollution that we... we <coughs> there are a lot of, there are a lot of uh, articles in, in epidemiology, I think, for exa example, that try to look at the uh, amount of disease attributable to some pollutant, mm -hmm. or uh, you know, the, some of the stuff on epigenetics is like that. And they're, they're not really talking about a, a hypothetical intervention that could be applied that would, would reduce pollution. They're just saying, I, I see some association here and, I'll, call, I'll, and, and uh, I'll talk about it as if it's causal, and I'll use language like the attributable risk you know, due to uh, mm -hmm. this pollutant, 
is, is something. And if you look at, at the way they're calculating attributable risk across all the risks, they add up to like 700%, mm -hmm. which, which makes no sense. So it's a mistake, but it, but it should be thought of as a causal problem, shouldn't it? I mean, it seems like one where, I mean, often there is a policy question there, um, whether VW should be making That's correct. Yeah, that's right. There, yeah. there's, uh, there's a, a bottom line causal question, but it has to do with the proposed intervention or collection of interventions. And you want to know which ones would be effective at reducing disease, for example. And, uh, and the way the, most of the literature is written, they're all confused about that. So I think in that sense, they do better to stick with what they can do and, and, and not uh, pretend that they're looking at the holy grail for, for uh, causality. Okay. So how, go ahead. So I'd say, I mean, just about whether it's over or underestimated, uh, emphasize, I had a, not very long ago, had an hour long debate with one of the best machine learning folks in the world mm -hmm. who teaches one of the, the biggest courses at Stanford. We had an hour long debate and, and he basically said that he didn't think that mm. um, there was anything that he could have done differently if he had thought ever about causal inference. Therefore, this is why he didn't <laughs> teach it in his course and all of his industry experience and everything else had, you know, it, it, it had not hurt him one little bit to never think about causal inference. And he's inference. pretty successful. <laughs> pretty successful, both in, in practice and in academics. And so, you know, you, you kind of think a little bit like, how do I get to that place? And so in some sense, I think, again, if you're predicting zip codes, if you're recognizing images, if you're discovering cats on YouTube, mm -hmm. you know, that's right. Like, you never needed to, to do that. There's but, big money in that. <laughs> but then at the same time, because you're sort of seduced into thinking about mm -hmm. that, then you come to the quick prediction problem and you don't recognize it as a problem that's making counterfactual predictions. And you sort of don't realize that maybe you could have done better by, by tailoring your model not to have the best, you know, mean squared error in the test set in my existing did data, but one that would instead do a better job I with counterfactual. I think I know who you're talking about. Did, did you give him the example of, of click prediction? Because well, we argued about it for an hour, <laughs> uh -huh. and I, I think afterwards, you know, he was somewhat convinced, so but I think I still don't think they actually change what they is teach. Is this somebody whose name has two letters? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Because he started working in reinforcement learning yeah. in the beginning of his career. All right, well, so then <laughs> maybe he didn't recognize it. But so I, I, I think just generally, though, I mean, it's not about a specific person, but I right. think that, you know, if you spend all of your life doing one kind of thing, then, you know, you, you're, you're used to that being successful. And but, so that's, but, that but your example is, is, the, is the revenue source for a lot of companies, including, I think, the one he works at. Uh -huh. um, exactly. So I think that it's, um, you know, it, something looks similar to your existing problems, and the existing framework seems to apply, but yet you don't step up and look and see whether, in fact, you could use a slightly different framework. But then, you know, similarly, when, when people used to make fun of me for working with big data, fortunately, they've mostly stopped. But, um, <laughs> you know, when people used to make fun of me for this, they would say things like, oh, well, you know, that's just all correlation, and, you mm -hmm. know, there's no real questions there, are there? And mm -hmm. so on, and so you know. They yeah, no, I remember hearing those those kinds of arguments. And of course, you we had some of them here yeah, last year. Yeah, yeah, and you still, of course, hear it today, and there's a, of course some truth to it. But at the same time, you know, there there was um, a sense that you know we just because the data is big and just because you're using predictive methods doesn't mean you're not working on interesting economic questions. Doesn't mean you're not testing theory. It doesn't mean that you're not able to do counterfactual predictions about causes and so on. And so you know. In this whole scale of things, like my own work has tried to, you know, hit the causation head on, but mm -hmm. like Sindel, I think, makes some really nice points when he says, you know, actually some kind of questions about optimal po economic policies, right. really the most important thing is just making a prediction. So mm -hmm. it may be that, you know, if I can predict who will never respond to an ad, that's kind of a no-brainer that I don't show them an ad, or right. maybe I do. If you already know that umbrellas will protect you, then knowing whether it's going to rain is, is really the important, important thing. Well, in, in other settings, you, when you're really fine-tuning things and your treatments have costs and so on, then really understanding sort of the full causal model and, and, and bringing the whole machinery to bear can be more worthwhile. So I think there's something for all of us to learn, and I think that's what makes this a really exciting time. And this community here really gives us all a great opportunity because everybody here really is kind of straddling multiple worlds and getting the chance to innovate by bringing in all these different techniques. Ben, why don't you jump in here? Yeah, so I think both approaches are really valuable, and, but if you look at education, I think... Education? Yeah, the, the pre 
I think conceptually predictive in predicting of machine learning is much easier to teach than uh, causal inference. And then if you look at all the curriculum in statistics departments and probably machine learning too, like causal inference is not taught very much. If it's taught, it's much harder to teach well. And so there's this energy constraint problem. People want to get down some fast mm -hmm. and get to use something, predictive become the easiest choice. I came to causal inference just through predictive work with computational neuroscience. So we try mm -hmm. to understand the brain. Mm -hmm. and at some point, work with Jack Galan's lab, we did very nice movie construction. It's kind of predictive. And then you say that, well, actually, you might want to do causal, right? You want to know what mm -hmm. stimuli stimulate the brain, not just they could have, they might have, they suggested, you know, nothing. So that's how I kind of start reading on yeah. causal Well, inference. I wonder if it comes to, depends a little bit on what background you come from, because if you're brought up in an econometrics framework, I think you, you tend to think much more <laughs> quickly about causality, and, and so maybe there's a, it depends on which path you come to it from. Yeah, I think it's kind of uh, sad in some sense, the tradition of causal inference that is not like upheld like in statistics departments as much as true. Well, essence, are, are we thinking uh, about this the right way, Don? I think you, you, you said that, you, that maybe there's a, a better way to bring this together. Well, I was thinking uh, about uh, what, what Susan was saying at Stanford. I don't think the Department of Statistics has, has taught a course in experimental design probably for four decades. That is that, is right. that right? I think it's right. Many of the graduates don't, don't really even know. define causal yeah. inference. <laughs> they, they, don't under, they don't understand what an experiment is. They don't understand how, what a Latin square is. They don't understand what partial replication is. Yeah. That they don't think they have any of the, any of the classical tools, uh, which is kind of, a, but, but they, that they do, do know how to do machine learning. They do, they, that's, it's become, a, I think, more or less a, a department that's uh, not interested in, in uh, many of the classical tools of statistics. So, so that, that's surprising. I mean, are you making a distinction between classical experimentation? I mean, they must be doing A-B testing all the time. They're doing it all the time, but, they, they, but they're not taught it. <laughs> I mean, hmm. okay. that, that's certainly my experience with yeah. the students. Although my co-author, uh, Stefan Wagner, is in this, is a PhD student with the Swiss department, but yeah. maybe that's why he came over to work with me. Is that, <laughs> because, is that because it's so easy? You don't need to be taught. Once you've, once you've randomized, then you've, you've taken care of the confounding variables like Leon was suggesting? Well, we have to do it precisely. Like mm -hmm. a lot of A-B testing that I've seen doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it does, mm -hmm. and it gives good results. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it doesn't make sense, but, but as you said, in the, the people have a lot of trust in it anyway. David. Yeah, so oh, <laughs> okay. sorry, I saw uh, you first. So when I contrast machine learning with, uh, with econometrics and causal inference, um, there are a couple of things that seem different. One is the, one is this sort of prediction versus uh, causality thing. And then another is in, um, uh, quantifying uncertainty. You know, statisticians and econometricians have have worried a lot about standard errors and confidence intervals, and I don't see computer scientists actually uh, worrying about that because they don't they don't actually care about their parameter estimates too much. And I, I was wondering what. Uh, yeah, there's a very what, different what mentality about how you assess the the fit of a model. Yeah, and in particular, you know, sometimes. Uh, I've been consulting with people at work recently a lot about. You know, they've they've actually run experiments on things. At and, work, and, uh, just go ahead and tell us. Oh, sorry, I'm yeah. I'm currently employed at Pandora. Yeah, I know. And uh, and I um, I noticed people computing uh, twice in the past month. I've had people compute a confidence interval for the. I mean, yay, they were actually computing one, but uh, for the effect of a treatment, and they didn't notice the fact that the treatment was assigned in a clustered way. And so they really, you know, it was assigned, the treatment was assigned by zip code, and they really should have been looking at the number of independent zip codes. They had not the number of independent mm -hmm. people. Or in another case, it was mm -hmm. the number of independent, they were, they were wanting to divide by the square root of the number of ad impressions when they really should have been doing the square root of the number of people because mm -hmm. it was assigned if, to the if some, so, yeah, correlation. So, so I'm, I'm wondering, you know, is, is machine learning missing well, out? A lot of you guys have, have kind of moved between these, these areas. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. Tempted to go to youth, Susan, maybe. Yeah, like the one comment I have on the, 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 the confidence intervals and so on, because that's something I've been working a lot on lately. Um, so I guess, you know, my, Stefan, my statistics co-author, and I produced a paper that was doing confidence intervals for random forests, which is the first mm -hmm. result of its kind. First of mm -hmm. all, 
I was like, how can there be hundreds of thousands of papers using a technique and nobody knows if the predictions are asymptotically normal? Well, part of it is that actually you have to modify the technique to get that result. So mm -hmm. it actually, it's not easy and the standard thing isn't asymptotically normal in, in centers. But then the, the second thing was, well, nobody cared. And why didn't they care? And in fact, he got a lot of pushback for working on this project. Like, who cares if it's asymptotically normal? Because I have a test set, and I can all get mean squared error in my test set, and that's the gold standard, not some asymptotic theory which may or may not hold in a particular data set. And so then we made the point, so, so he moved from doing prediction random forest to what we call causal forest, mm -hmm. where we're estimating a causal effect and putting a confidence interval around the causal effect. And there he could justify to the, the kind of machine learning part of the audience why we needed normality. That's because there ain't no test set for the causal effect. It's a missing data problem. Mm -hmm. There is no individual for whom I observe their actual causal effect. Therefore, I have no test set with no mean squared error criteria to have. So in some work, I've tried to figure out how to estimate that criteria. But if my estimator is bad, then that's going to screw up that criteria. It's clearly not an, an unambiguous gold standard. So the asymptotic normality and the confidence intervals play a much bigger role. And just a simpler example of this is ordinary least squares, best predictor of y on x, best linear predictor of y on x in a data set, right? But economists don't run on OL ordinary least squares very often. Instead, we reduce our explanatory power by using an instrumental variable. So if you wanted to regress quantity on price, the best fit would just be the least squares estimate. But of course, we understand that, you know, the price, things that are moving the price are also moving the quantity. Like you raise the price at a time when you think people are willing to pay more and so on. And so we need an instrumental variable to make the, the fit of the model worse, but our causal prediction better. And so we get that as economists. Of course we don't want to maximize the fit. We want to get the best causal estimator. But that is completely antithetical to the prediction context where mean squared error is the gold standard and in fact superior because it's not, doesn't need prior review assumptions. But it really depends on what you're trying to achieve. I mean, exactly. yeah. yeah. If you're trying to predict that something is a file on a zip code in an envelope. Right. It is the gold standard. So which bit of ink caused it to be a file. But if I did ordinarily squares, for those of you who aren't economists, you know, what you find is demand curve slopes a long way. You'll find that when you raise price, people buy more. And so we're, we're, we're smacked in the face. You couldn't publish a paper like that. You have to find a way to reduce your predictive power and get a better cause. If what you're trying to do is get the causality the of causal the- causal effect but, of changing yeah. prices. But, but there may be times when you, you, you want to, there may be times when you just and do a prediction example, thing. no, you never would care about Hedonic, but well, whatever, we can talk about <laughs> it. Um, okay, okay. Um, no, go ahead, Leon. It's interesting to look at this in the context of Brian Mann's paper about the two cultures, where he opposes the culture of creating a model and characterizing the fit and basically a very traditional statistics and the model of basically constructing black boxes that do certain functions at, that you measure on a, typically on a test set. Uh, it's very nice to construct a black, black box, but then you have to know what you want to do with the black box. And if what you want to do with the black box is well measured by a testing set, you're fine. If it's not, well, you have to do something else or find other ways to measure it. But okay, that's common sense, you know, just... Uh, ben, go ahead. So, I agree with Susan that basically for if you want to estimate culture effect, we'll talk about the heterogeneous effect later. Yes. You want confidence intervals. But I think the, I will talk tomorrow, I will have a asymptotic result too. But I don't think as, asymptotic result also has its own problems, mm -hmm. right? Um, because it's, if you know mathematics, it's, very, it's called weak convergence. <laughs> and it's weak, <laughs> yeah. right? Which means that you don't really capture the uncertainty. And I think about in my career of 13 years as a statistician, I have never seen anybody validate beyond simulation the confidence interval. And then it starts to trouble me, right? We, 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 we give uncertainty measure, but we actually don't validate why that's the right measure. It's better to have something better than nothing, oh, because the level, it's very hard to validate. In simulation, we know what's the truth, we know the coverage. But in real problems, we do give these uncertainties, but even the mathematics, we don't know because if you really know, it's one over square root of n under the most uh, like hmm. uh, nice conditions, and you have a certain moment, and that means long tail, a lot of the IT, IT problem, it's mm -hmm. going to be problematic, right? So it's good to have a sometime because I'll have one tomorrow, mm -hmm. but it's really <laughs> not ideal. I just mm -hmm. think that with small computation, we hope we can do better at assessing uncertainty. I think that's more fundamental. Um, All right. How about Sinan? Yeah. 
comments are, are sort of dancing around the answer to this question, so maybe I'm just gonna ask it directly. Last year at this conference, I was, and several of us were having uh, conversations or debates um, with uh, John Langford and Jeremy Howard about whether mm -hmm. machine learning can uncover the causal structure of, a, of an endogenous social process, okay? So forget about the zip code example, but think about the traditional endogenous social processes that we would be interested in, you know, where there's equilibria or there's, you know, people behaving and, and so on and so forth. And so I guess my question is, and Ben, you made a distinction, you said there's machine learning and there's causal inference, and we've talked about one is taught, one isn't taught. So the, the, the question is, can machine learning without exogenous variation, without experimental variation, and so on, recover the causal structure of an endogenous social process? And if so, what's required in terms of assumptions and data uh, to do it? Who wants to try that? Maybe Leon? Well, no? I think okay. it can, can be highly suggestive if you have a good, like, get a mechanism. I just was reading some paper before I came here that, I mean, cancer, Prediction. I mean, in the early beginning of machine learning, we had a lot of attempts using machine learning method to predict cancer based on non-cancer, right? But the field, the field also moved. People now want to have mechanisms, basically towards understanding and hope and do some intervention, right? I think mm -hmm. it's also predictive. A lot of times, it's a low-hanging fruit for a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. I would see it as a first step. Mm -hmm. Could be suggestive, but it's not conclusive. And you, it's statistics, as George Box would say, so it's an iterative process. It's not a one hit thing, and you shouldn't draw a conclusion. It's accumulation of evidence towards something, and you can think it's approximation. So I think it could be effective if you have, give you some suggestion, but you have to follow up eventually. So if, if you classify things better, that might help you with your causal inference ultimately to understand it what- It give you something to look at, right? Yeah, if you have you sparse start, model, something you, you can patterns. put your mind around it. I mean, I, I had a discussion with another big machine learner which behind something called deep learning, and I was talking to him two years ago, I said, don't you want to understand how deep learning works? And the answer was no. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe things have changed. And he, he said, I'm happy with thousands of lines of code. Right, so, so but people also change, mm. right? So I think um, the field is moving, it's very evolving. I think we should keep that in mind. Nothing is really fixed. It just depends on the problem we tackle, how rigorous we push ourselves. Anyone else want to add to that? I, uh, I'll add uh, one thing that has to do with the discussion about asymptotics. I, my own feeling is asymptotics is highly overrated. <laughs> because it, it, it almost never works well. And as soon as you get into a problem with many parameters, and many parameters doesn't have to be b very big, it could be a few hundred with, with thousands of data points, right. the usual asymptotic approximations are completely horrible. Yeah. They're, they're off by, fact, by orders of magnitude. And, and so you know that from Real example. For me, real example. Yeah. And also theory can show that too. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, th I, I, I agree with that too. I guess I was kind of contrasting it with mean squared error, which completely fails mm. right. causal inference. So you need something else. Mm. Okay, right here. Go ahead. So I was going to, like, I guess, so bribe my perspective on the discussion that was happening before. So now it's an amazing question, which I think is very good. Uh, I have an opinion about it, but I, I'll share that maybe with you later. But. Sort of my question or my comment was that I think that for someone who started off more in like uh, computer science, moved to stats, and then moved to like you know IS and more sort of uh, the idea of uh, of economics and econometrics, having never had actually in, you know an econometrics class either, as someone mentioned earlier. Um, my thought is that machine learning sort of focuses starts off with this paradigm where things don't change, right? So if if, if your system you're you're measuring does not change, then it's fine to estimate it. From a, from, a, from a training data set, and then look at what happens in the test data set, right? Because it's not changing. Um, mm -hmm. And it's gonna predict for you in the future what's gonna happen. But if you're, if actually by taking action, mm -hmm. the thing, your system changes, right. then it doesn't make sense to just look at that because when you automatically implement something or change it, something's gonna happen, and therefore your estimates of what's gonna happen aren't based on that change, it's based on what would happen in their original paradigm. And so I think the mm -hmm. challenge is that we get taught having taken a lot of machine learning classes at CMU and had a lot of great teachers and who taught me those things. I learned as I began to think about sort of these more you know, problems in economics and thinking about the problems that I think affect me in, so, in society and, and sort of you know, more generally is that those things change when we take action. And so if you're not, mm -hmm. if you don't assume things change, and I think machine learning is doing a fantastic job at understanding and estimating sort of what the <coughs> response surface is to some, for some function. 
But if things are going to change mm -hmm. when you take an action or when time shifts or whatever it is, then your predictions are no longer useful and therefore machine learning, is, I think it's failing in that sense. I think that's where well, that's a, is actually doing better and trying to do better, right? So that's a really important classic critique that you know you, you estimate things and, and then when you start, when you intervene, that's exactly when they're, those, those relationships, those correlations no longer hold. Yeah, but you can also adapt machine learning. I'm now speaking for machine learning. I mean, we have been doing this video like a neuroscience kind of problem. You kind of use the moving kind of covariates and put into a moving type of machine learning model in some sense. You, you assume that stability is only for a certain period of time and you use only predictor in that time. So you can, you still can get somewhere, even fundamentally, you can do a lot better. Yeah, I think you kind of have to know how, or assume how things are gonna change, right? I think a lot, in a lot of problems, you're trying to estimate something like, uh, you know, the effects of a social program, you don't know maybe how people are gonna You always to assume that. the future has to be a little similar. That's the kind of, I would say, fundamental <laughs> assumption about prediction, right? If, at least the aspect things you want to smoothly. predict, yeah. at least the aspect you want to predict has to remain more or less, otherwise, nobody can do it. Right? Yeah, but, but I think there's it's a more <laughs> fundamental critique than that, I think. It's, it's not just saying that, that, that the future is changing, it's saying that that when you see things co-varying the data, that doesn't mean that one is, is causing other, and, and that if you move one of them, you're going to cause the other one to move in the, in the same pattern. No, the two so issues about the time, yeah. the causal effect with time, the other just predictive with time component, right? Mm -hmm. I think the two related but different issues. But I, I think what you're saying is the main body of machine, uh, sorry, the main paradigm of machine learning has been training set, testing set. Yeah. It was a big factor for progress, worked very well. Yeah. Uh, on the side, there were always people doing other things. So people are not completely unaware that these things exist. But it's true that if you follow a class in machine learning, you have training set, testing set, start with that, and people can get the feeling that this does everything. Okay, fine, that's a mistake. It doesn't do everything. I mean, I think machine learning should, it's also evolving, right? If you take anything oh, yeah. static, then it's gonna be problematic. And can I segue into that? Please go so, Sure, so go I ahead. Wanna, turn Sinan's question around. So he asked, um, can we use machine learning to find causal uh, links, right? Uh, the other way around, if you work on machine learning in practice, then very often if you work on, like me, on rec recommender systems and rankers, then you build these systems that are continually adapting and they are not static. So they're continually taking new data and learning, so there's a feedback loop. So I then want to validate that when I build a new model, that this model is better than the last model. And I want to validate this using an experimental method. So how do you think the stuff you're talking about can help machine learners validate that in the real world, their model is actually better than the one they had before? So rather than using cross-validation or uh, test set type uh, methods. New paradigm experiment. New experimental paradigm is needed. So new experiments. When you start thinking about experiments, there is a notion of an experimental paradigm. Now, training set, testing set is a very simple one that serves machine learning very well, but for many things, and in particular causation, you need to do much more refined experimental uh, mm -hmm. studies. Mm -hmm. That's it. Now, I can tell you the other question. Can causation help machine learning? I can tell you why I'm excited about causation in the context of machine learning. Because for me, I came to machine learning with the idea of AI. You know. And uh, okay, we do some level of learning, but we do no reasoning. And in causation, there is the empirical aspect, and there is the reasoning aspect. If A causes B and B causes C, then A causes C. So that's another angle on causation. So if you want to mix machine learning with some level of reasoning, it's going to be very difficult to do it in an expressive way without having some notion of causation somewhere. And, and another thing, I mean, Sinan maybe made it a little too hard by saying without any external intervention, but suppose you were allowed to add some randomness and, and, and well, arbitrary, then, is it, then it, that, it, that, I, that makes your job of identifying causality much easier. Of course. Yeah. Let me just return a bit, uh, revise a little bit what I was saying to answer Sinan's question. I think in the predictor, I was thinking about like, you have major predictors, usually that's a very good indication, could be causal. But if a lot of weak predictors, that's very, very hard. Then it's very hard to, to even be good suggestive. I mean, we have been doing system biology and they're uh, looking for like what genes cause the uh, fruit fly to develop, right? And, and we basically did the kind of 
non vectoral, you know, matrix factorization and do correlation. Kind of machine learning C thing without knowing how to do a confidence interval, right? And then we go for a knockout experiment, right? So, really, our um, key is going to be seeing people manipulate the genes and we're in the middle of looking at it. And it's not, but maybe we have to go more looking at more genes together, but looking at marginal, we, we kind of rely on the knockout experiments to manipulate. But we R rely, rely on what experiments? Knockout experiment. That means okay. you, you perturb a gene, something mm -hmm. called CRISPR. Knockout, yeah. Yeah, so it's like a molecular scissor to, to alternate genes. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we look for very strong signal in this predictive kind of game. And then we could be completely wrong, right? Because there could be loops and things like that, right? But that's what kind of, we, we do 40 experiments, we get one, two. That's still not bad, blue fly, not too expensive. So there's also, <laughs> <laughs> right, I mean, don't you, right? So, so there's a cost there too, right? How much you do your analysis and how much is the downstream more like intervention cost you? To prove causation, yeah, yeah. To, to prove it, yes. But you can s to get the hint, no. Yeah, you can. You can. Yeah, they'd address that point, right? I mean, there you can read Don's book to get some of them, and so on. That say, you know, without any exogenous variation and without any assumptions, you can't identify any causal effect. So then, I think what you know, different branches of economics have tilted more towards, you know, making no additional assumptions beyond, say, an independent assumption or maybe experimental variation versus layering on more and more functional form assumptions or modeling assumptions or optimization assumptions to answer harder and harder questions. And, and, and there I think it really just depends on like how important it is to you to get an exact answer to a question. Like if I'm going to decide, you know, are these two firms going to merge a multi-billion dollar merger, I need a number for the consumer welfare effect and I'm going to make keep making assumptions until I get a number. Um, you can, of course, look at robustness and, and, and things like that, but ultimately, you know, you have to get a number versus in other contexts where you, you don't, you're not going to make quite too many assumptions and rely, then you might just get an, an, an average effect of, for a certain population or, or things like that, that that doesn't fully answer the question you were interested in. So Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Dean. Come on, Dean, come on, weigh in on that. I, I was going to ask all of you. Well, 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 I, do you, you're going to talk on that point? Or? Um, I was going to ask a different question, but I'll, but I'll, I'll answer that, which I think is okay. that you do need a few additional assumptions, usually for those kinds of things, for causal discovery, which is often how that problem is sort of framed. Yeah. And then you can get to the literature. You need additional things like these faithfulness assumptions that there are no exact zeros by chance. Dean, let's come back to you for your question, but I want to get Don in on this. Uh, you know, so how important <laughs> is the, uh, the, 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 the physical act of randomization, and what, what can we learn from, from non-random variation? Well, I think the physical act of randomization is extremely important. Because if you go back, historically, there are a lot of people who were writing before Fisher proposed that you actually do physical randomization. And uh, uh, they would say, well, if the plots had been randomly assigned to the different fertilizers, then there's certain expectations, you know, they're doing, you know, mm -hmm. all, all the usual uh, math stuff. And, and, uh, and in fact, so Naaman was doing that in his thesis in 1923. And Gossett, you know, Mr. T-Test was doing that in the papers in, in the 1920s as well. But then Fisher proposed that the mathematics is telling you to do something. Mathematics is telling you to physically randomize. And that was a real breakthrough. <coughs> And but but can you learn from non-random variation? Well, you have to, pretty much you have to uh, posit that there was some, some hypothetical randomization there, or it becomes purely a prediction problem for the missing potential outcome. And then you have to, have to posit something else, or something else. 
So let's go back to you, Najee. Uh, I think that, that near the front frontier on, on uh, many factor design is something that I'm slightly involved in uh, on how do you, how do you convert uh, beta cell, uh, uh, stem cells to beta cells to, to, to quote cure childhood uh, diabetes. There's something like what, tw 20 steps along the way. There are all these different factors that you can vary in temperatures and, 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 and different mixes. So you have maybe 20 factors. So you, you, even at, at two levels, that's you know that's a thousand different treatment conditions. They have these trays that put in these uh, different amounts of liquid. And you can't do it the usual way. It, it doesn't work. So you have to have some understanding of, of aliasing and, and fractional replication uh, to even go through that. Or three D printing. You know, there's all these kinds of things you can vary where the errors start occurring around the corners and stuff. And so what can you do? You can design an experiment. That's what you do. You have all these factors, and you, and, you, and you can vary them. You can vary them in a way that you can you can get as much knowledge, pretty much, from half the amount of sample, and twice as quickly, if you understand aliasing and and and, and principles of frac fractional factorials, which, which which nobody at Stanford understands, I think. So, <laughs> I'm not I'm not criticizing. Stanford. It's a great place, and probably the best staff department by by reputation, at least for. Do you want to the last defend your colleagues at all? Or? Stanford. I mean, Mark Allen, I think, is writing. Sort of like piggyback on the other A/B tests that are being done yeah. in, pa in the background, yeah. and, and for somehow. For causal inference, we know that we want to use the randomization for our causal conclusion, not the, the, the part of the data that's sort of correlated with unobservables that are also correlated with your outcome. That's the idea of incremental variables: you isolate the experimental for the good variation, and you throw away the bad variation. But nobody has figured out how to do that on click prediction scale, um, and which would undoubtedly involve. Like you could probably do the theorem. You could easily that you're not identified in the sense that econometricians would want you to be, but maybe it's good enough. And how do you, what's the science of how you make it good enough and even evaluate good enough and so on. And so I think it puts together this like this kind of bandit literature, the textual bandit literature, the active experimentation, all of these ideas, kind of, kind of big data, you know, computation, because you got you know, billions of features in these models. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Nobody, I don't, I think we, nobody's really even tried to get that problem right from who, who thought about causal inference, maybe other than Leon and, uh, you know, whoever your friends are. <laughs> um, yeah, this is in the paper and the tests were not talk. Yes. Ben? So let me see what Dean was asking. I think there's a little bit maybe interaction machine learning designs through this compressed sensing or sparse modeling. People have been kind of going to design through randomized Gaussian design matrix or sparse matrix. And I was hoping, I've been working there, is I was hoping somebody actually would tap into the design literature because a lot of applications, the randomized design matrix is not the easiest to implement physically. And I would think that people would tap into the design experiment literature for linear models and use some of the nice deal. But that never took off. There, there were some one or two papers and was hard to publish and eventually didn't really appear. And that was just unfortunate. There was this huge literature on design which really understand the linear Do space. Do you think it's going to be revived? Um, I think it depends on uh, whether people get in. People go through you know, after fads, right? People don't <laughs> always do the thing best. You can start a new one. Yeah, so, so I think that's one area I think a little bit interaction, but um, it didn't really take off. There was some paper, but didn't even get published. Do you have anything to add to that, Leon, before? Because Susan called you out a little, but <laughs> well, uh, in a good way. About the question whether you can get ideas of that causation without randomization. Yeah. Um, if you want to prove the causation, you have to randomize. I'm pretty sure of that. There's a theorem, it's a theorem. Uh, but you can get a lot of interesting hints, especially when the variables are continuous. Like you have continuity effect or discontinuity analysis. Mm -hmm. It's something that's going to give interesting hints mm -hmm. and is supposed to be observational. Mm -hmm. uh, you could say it's a proxy for actually saying the discontinuity is an assumption that there, the, there is kind of the smoothness and that kind of randomization and so on. But well, there is a little bit of something. Another example. That's getting very popular in some areas, yeah. yeah. Another example is um, <coughs> in the context of deep learning, mm -hmm. one of the things we often do is take a very large dimensional space mm -hmm. and embed it into a smaller dimensional space that's typically dense and continuous. Mm -hmm. And uh, you do this in a way that's very often unsupervised or just, uh, or maybe you take two and you do a co embedding or things mm -hmm. like that. You mean like without even any training set or just? Yeah. Well, there is a training set, but the, there is no label. Okay. Or maybe you have two, uh, two information, like uh, let's say uh, people and uh, URLs, something like that. And you're going to embed the people and the URL in the same space <laughs> using techniques that are not unlike the techniques of the 70s, like all the Benzikri analysis, for instance. Mm -hmm. But uh, sometimes not linear, sometimes different laws. So there is, a, there is a, a plethora of these techniques. Now, if you do something like this, on, on observational data, you reduce a problem that's very complex to a relatively slow dimensional, small dimensional problem. In that small dimensional problem, you might need less randomization to do something useful. So you could say, I have a huge problem with a, a huge combinatorial space to explore with randomization and decide that it's hopeless, it's very difficult. Or you can decide to reduce this problem to a smaller dimensional space using observational data and say, I'm going to work in that space but with proper randomization in that space and do something. And presumably, and that might the work. whole art is, is whether you've reduced it in a, in a use, I mean, if you well, reduce it the wrong course, way. Of course, but there are ch these are chances to work. I think in some sense, I would think that Dan's propensity score is in that spirit, right? You basically do, do a linear score through. Uh, when it's linear, yeah. yeah. But, uh, you, you but in the spirit, I think. So. You could do other kinds yeah, of reductions. Yeah, you could do other the, the kind of reductions you can do can be very rich. Right. So you can reduce the need for randomization using the help of observational data. Or there are all the doubly robust methods where by using, let's say, a model built on observational data, you're going to be able to reduce the variance in your counterfactual mm -hmm. estimates, mm -hmm. which is interesting. It's I'd not like a proof. Back a little bit. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes. Please Does do. Work? Is yeah. that on? Yeah. I, I, I think so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. On the idea that you actually need randomization to learn about cause and effect. Uh, obviously, the real randomized experiments weren't ever done until 1925. I think we learned about certain things in uh, 2003. We learned about by uh, drinking lots of arsenic every day is not good for your health. Uh, if effects are big enough, you don't really need randomization. We flew air, we get, you know, Wright brothers had airplanes flying, locomotive steam, industrial revolution, all that stuff took place. 
not, not, not using randomized experiments. So the idea that, 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 he, that randomization is a great invention for learning about sudden cause and effect. If the effects are big enough, you don't need it. Anybody that anyone ever want to agree with that? <laughs> uh, I can give an example. There is the, the famous cholera study. And if you look at the argument he develops, they're quite interesting. And some of them are hilarious. Like for instance, uh, he says, well, uh, let's look at the subpopulation of uh, brewers, people making beers. They don't drink water. So they're not going to drink water from the pump. And they didn't get cholera, except once. And all his friends told me that I don't know what happened to this guy. He drank water that day. So that, that's in the book of, um, oh, I forgot his name. Hmm? The, the, the cholera guy from the 19th century. Snow. 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 Okay. Snow. It's in his book. The book is a very good read. You can find it online. It's very interesting. There is no notion of randomization, but a lot of convergent information that all converges to say that eh, maybe that pump is responsible, this water pump is responsible. And one we of them is this brewer afterwards, thing. right? Yeah. Just to be clear. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> with beer and water, for those who prefer water. Master brewer. A few examples without like randomization is smoking and cancer, right? It's a series of observational studies, mm -hmm. but with well-designed observations. Probably studies. be unethical to and do the, do the randomized experiment there. <laughs> most people believe smoking and cancer causal. Yeah, how many randomized experiments animals or with people have ever showed any link between cigarette smoking and lung cancer. But so I think it's something they've, they've done hundreds of them. Yeah. Did they ever show a link? But so one of the things that's kind of really? interesting about this observational study stuff is it's strong to say you need randomization, <laughs> but you might make assumptions that take observational variation and under some assumptions they'll give you causal effects. Like if you have an observational study controlling for propensity scores, Don's famous results and so on. So I think it's, uh, it's the, the, what you need is a framework that's going to tell you which assumptions will take your observational data to a causal effect. And so I think the point is that without assumptions and without randomization, then you're nowhere. With, with randomization, you're definitely somewhere. And then there's a whole space of combinations of assumptions and, and pseudo-randomization. Yeah, but that's, a, that's a pretty big loophole, right? Assumptions. That, yeah. That's well, a that, 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 that's why, Eric, I mean, yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's what yeah. it's all about. And so really, that's what this whole literature has been, you know, decades doing, is trying to flesh out what kinds of assumptions this and this and different yeah. difference make one set of assumptions, regression discontinuity makes another set of assumptions, and terminal variables make another set of assumptions. And then, you know, if, when you use the Pearl framework, there, the, actually, that framework has led people to think about whole different categories of assumptions, some of which might be, you know, good or bad, and that framework might lead you in good directions for certain problems, and, and other frameworks lead you in good directions for other problems. But ultimately, there are theorems that say, without assumptions or randomization, you know, you're nowhere. Let, let's speak seriously about the master brewer, because this one always puzzles me. I never was able to understand why this is a convincing argument. But it's convincing. So none of the master brewers got cholera. They don't drink water, except the one who drank water. And when you say this, we have a big laugh, and yes, OK, case is made, after, especially after um, previous things. Mm -hmm. And why is the assumption there? It's very difficult to explain. There is a lot of background knowledge that we use to decide, oh, that's, uh, that's a compelling argument. And I well, think so I find it. There's nothing common about the brewers that gave them immunity to cholera, so you're not. Other than what they're drinking. Yeah, so, they're, so you're not you're not stating that assumption because it seems so obvious, and I think that gets back to Don's point about big effects, or sometimes the, assum the, the, the assumption yeah. you would need to undermine your result is so wild that you don't need to bother stating it. But yeah. fundamentally, ab absolutely, right. you know, there there right. is an assumption there. Yeah, yes. could, could, I mean, conceivably they could be from a, a different country or a different, have some other characteristic yeah, of but, but, but you're right by saying that it's not really the assumption the key, it's the big effect. In that case, the effect is so big that it's difficult to ignore. Right, but having a mathematical framework that oh, helps yeah, sure, you then sure, understand, sure, sure. okay, you know, th exactly what have I assumed and then how big would a failure of the assumption have to be to undo my effect? And that's what most economics empirical seminars spend all the time doing yeah. because Almost never yeah. do we actually believe the assumptions required to identify our effect. We never have a good enough instrument to identify whether two cars are good substitutes or not or whatever. So then you spend the whole seminar arguing about 
you know, whether the countervailing effects that are left out were enough to undo the quantitatively important. Ultimately, it sounds like you're building a case with lots of different kinds of uh, stories about the world, what you know about brewers, what you have from the data, and you put it all together in but some kind of a Bayesian If I see a big map. effect, do I need to discuss the assumption that much? Because the effect is so big, it's hard to ignore. Maybe there is a way to take it the other way around. Is it the size of the effect that really drives it? I'm not sure. It's that's, its that's size and its apparent determinism. I yeah, can, that's, the, that's more to it. I can get a huge positive effect that says increasing prices, increasing There yeah, is also the a posteriori. probably not the size yeah. of the effect. No, there is a posteriori effect. And even, too. If, even if the, it, yeah. Only one of the master brewer died. Mm -hmm. And after investigation, I found out that it's only one who drank water that day. Mm -hmm. So it's after. So basically, the observation, only one of the master brewer no, dies comes first. No, but I think there was... I, I don't know, I'm confused with this thing, I must No, say. but I think in that story, there was a lot of other information. I think the brewer actually, whose mom was moved by still using the well n next to the, the contaminant. So there was a lot of contextual information, not just this alone. Yeah, I, I think there was a lot of contextual spatial layout of London and where the Broadway Street and all that. Oh, yeah, yes, so, so that, so that was one of the points he was making. Yeah, but yeah. I think it's not not as simple as just one was it. No, no, yeah, yeah, there I was one a water piece wave. of evidence. He had, yeah. piece of the, he had the map, he yeah. had a lot of little stories, but right. some pieces of evidence were anecdotal, and even though they're anecdotal, like the master brewers, they carry some weight. When I read it, I say, oh, yeah. oh yes, sure. When that's our judgment call, right? That it's different from yeah. Proof, I guess. No, it's not proof, I agree. We'll buy things, well, but well, the well, relationship. Yeah. Well, thank you, John, for stirring that up a little bit and <laughs> clarifying. So Let's I go over here to a question. Yeah, so I actually just have this next segue to what I want to talk about, which is um, one of the things that got really excited about the Canary Graphical is around the structure of scientific revolutions, mm -hmm. uh, which, wow, would be so cool to participate in a paradigm shift of some kind. Um, You're watching I, it here. <laughs> Pick it up because uh, uh, you know just to, just to make it a little more provocative. Um, <laughs> if, it, if that's not that's not provocative enough, you know, Chris Anderson wrote this cover story in Wired uh, a few years ago, saying that that big data means the end of theory. I think even the end of the scientific method or something <laughs> like that. You know, I, I, no. I'm sure you four. Yeah, I'm sure you all disagree with that. So let me make it, let me make it a little bit something that maybe you you might not disagree with. Uh, Peter Norvig said that. Um, all models are wrong, and increasingly, uh, you can make real progress without them. Maybe okay. Don, right. let's hear Don. A, I guess that's, that's a modification of, of a quote from George Box. Right, Box said that all models are wrong, and, and, and some, are useful. You, some are useful. But he's, but, but Peter Norberg is saying something more yeah, more provocative, saying that I've you heard that. Yeah. That, that you can do without them. I, I don't think so. In terms of the value of conceptual thinking has never been higher because you have all this data and so then you, in some sense, you know, right, right now you can get all the low hanging fruit out of it, but then very quickly, you know, if you want to think about what, what to do next, you actually realize that you have to think. Like when you are students, you should get like, okay, here's the Shimkus data and it's a nice <coughs> rectangle and here are all the units and these are the variables and there's just only so much you can do. There's not as much need for creativity. Mm -hmm. But now that th it, there's so many different things you can do with the data, there's so many hypotheses, there's so many ways you can you can turn it and twist it and combine it. That so it sounds like you both think that Peter's exactly backwards. Yeah, so there's a conceptual thinking is just the first part, which, which is a kind of theory. But then also, you know, we spent a lot of the day talking about all the shortcomings of short-term experiments and all the ways that things can get confounded in, in unexpected ways and so on. And that's where, you know, the, the again, the conceptual thinking, the theory helps. So I had a, had a guest speaker in my class last week from eBay who ran selling there for a number of years. And he basically said, like, one piece of advice for firms is if you, there was anybody in your firm that understood what the engineers call second order effects, which is like feedback effects. Like if you do this to the seller, then, mm -hmm. you know, the sellers will leave or they'll, if you change, make, you know, reward mm -hmm. free shipping, then they'll use cheap shippers, all those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. That is the most uh, irreplaceable person in your firm. Hmm. Um, hmm. And you know, he's not an economist or a scientist or anything else, he's just the vice president of eBay. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that that's exactly right. When these complicated marketplaces with all sorts of feedback effects, you can have all the data in the world, but if you're not able to think 
about what you should be measuring and understand where your measurements and your A-B test, your short-term A-B test give you the right answer and where the wrong answer, you're going to drive very quickly, very fast off a cliff. They'll innovate very quickly, but just in the wrong direction. So uh, I think to just you guys want, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Leon. Go ahead. Yeah. Or I have something to say about the story of paradigm shift and yeah. the, the yeah. end of science. Yeah. Uh, the end of the scientific method, certainly no. If you want to do data science, you have to be very scientific about it, mm -hmm. number one. Now, the paradigm shift might be somewhere else, and there is an idea that I heard from Vatnik that I'm going to repeat here. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's sort of interesting. I'm not sure it's true, but it's sort of interesting. And he says, I can split science in basically two categories. One is like physics, like the motion of planets. Mm -hmm. A small number of rules mm -hmm. form a theory that describes it very well. Mm -hmm. I can wait and there was another no experiment there. No, I can wait another millennium of observing the planets, mm -hmm. and that's going to account for it. I'm pretty sure of it. And there are other fields like social sciences, biology, everything, where every time you get more data, you have to tweak your theory and add more things. E every new data is almost an exception. So if you want to model it accurately, mm -hmm. or as accurately as possible, the quantity or the, the size of your theory increases all the time. And uh, mm -hmm. an interesting thing is that we're starting to understand by using, uh, well, uh, I could say machine learning, but advanced statistics in general, uh, how to actually make useful predictions in these situations. In but the second situation. In the second situations. Basically, we, we cannot describe the system in a theoretical way that's simple. And, and that just, just to be clear, head, it's not that the second one that they hadn't figured it out correctly. It's that it inherently requires more and more The question is, I, 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 is it, is it uh, inherent to yeah. the scientific discipline that, that when you get more data, or the, the basically the size of the theory you need mm -hmm. to describe the data is going to increase uh, without, mm -hmm. without end. Mm -hmm. There is a long tail effect, mm -hmm. basically. If it's inherent, it's interesting to know that we can use uh, advanced statistical methods or machine learning or whatever, however mm -hmm. you want to call them, mm -hmm. to make useful predictions in this situation. Mm -hmm. And if this is the case, then this is a big chance to change because this is not how we did science before. This is a paradigm shift like what we're That hearing. might be a paradigm shift. I don't know if it's true because uh, when you have a theory that grows infinitely, you have to pass the information to other people. So, so communicability is, is a problem. Mm -hmm. But that might be a change in the way we do things that's going to, to, to have an effect in a couple of centuries. I'm not, I don't know if it's true, but that was that Nick's idea, and I think it's interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, now, interesting. Yeah. Uh, you still need the scientific method because you won't be able to use these advanced statistical methods if you don't look at your data with a very good scientific eye. Mm -hmm. Just, uh, yeah. I think for, for biology and social science, I do think that it's kind of paradigm shift. I work with biologists. And you realize that a lot of the new technology, all the omics and all that, they, the biologists also don't understand. So the data scientists or statistician really become a scientist and work with them. It's different from they come from small systems. Mm -hmm. And system biology is multiple genes, multiple interactions. And very much we're dealing with them. And a lot of called non-hypothesis driven research, you kind of fish, but definitely they shall validate and good biologists do. So that's one point. The other point is that, um, I remember when Peter Nowak, when I heard about it, it was like Google won the translation mm -hmm. contest, right. German, yeah, English. And I was very bothered by that comment, and I became happy when I realized that in, he, he would never deny he doesn't need computation, right? I'm sure he wouldn't. <laughs> right, then, then the Google would go. Right, but if you look at Kern Gorov's uh, like uh, Turing machine based on probability dish, like theory based on Turing machine, mm -hmm. These two are the same thing. Modeling, probability, and computation are really the same thing. And if you look at the uh, translation, mm -hmm. it's a lot of, I, I remember it was a lot of uh, humanly translated um, corpus, mm -hmm. and then a lot of search. Mm -hmm. And the search, to be efficient, is kind of probabilistic. Yeah, right. no, absolutely. So, but so I, I, think I feel point like the model was there. <laughs> it's just not in the form right. that he probably recognized it conceptually is needed, and and that last point I want to make and, is and that. And to be, it, it, it's a very different model from the, all the linguists had been working with. Uh, so, yeah. he, you know, he's but coming still from he basically had a problem. I mean, he couldn't really serve without a model to know wh which one tried to match, right? Yeah. If you just do s exhaustive search, there's no way you can be very efficient, right? Okay. So I think it's underneath maybe a different name, concept is there. Mm -hmm. And also mathematics, I think so far is the best reproducible language we know. When we're talking <laughs> mathematics, and that's extremely important when you talk of conceptual mm -hmm. difficult problems. Mm -hmm. If two people have so much error, when you 
communicate, there's no way you can work together. So I think that's another reason you do need conceptual theory. All right, we have, a, we have about 15 minutes, so we have, I think, I think, go ahead. Communication scholars are really sensitized to status hierarchies because all communication scholars want to be sociologists, all so so sociologists want to be economists. But increasingly, it's clear in this conversation that we're having here that all economists and computer scientists want to be physicists. <laughs> so when we take Leon's definition of like randomization, it's, there's no sort of human agency or anything in his sort of definition of randomization and causation, these sorts of things. We could be running particles through randomization, we could be running ferrets through randomization, and, and these sorts of things. And so to get back, uh, to Sean's question about sort of the paradigm shift, uh, do we want to sort of maintain the sort of get at the sort of monocausality? Do we want to be the physicist and establish that strong A always causes B? Or are we seeing that shift towards more of the biological perspective or the social science sort of more qualitative perspective where this you've got multiple forms of causation? And maybe when we think about what Senfield said this morning about like sort of the limits of using machine learning to understand the limits of what's predictable and explore the sort of the dark matter of what's sort of the causality we kind of leave behind and instead use the machine learning to explore and understand the sort of the social phenomena that we can't sort of predict in a sort of very monocausal way. So how would you sort of go about, you know, is it time to sort of leave monocausality behind, embrace the complexity, and sort of find models that kind of get at that in a better way? Similar to what you were picking up on, on Leon, but, but maybe you, were you saying that broadly true or maybe just in certain categories? Uh, I look at my ad problem. I have a big machine with a lot of codes and everything. And if I change the smurf somewhere and uh, turn the blurb, it's going to do something to my clicks and I want to know why. And uh, there is, it's a perfectly objective question and I don't see how you can solve it without uh, understanding the consequence of the manipulations you want to do. You can understand them in a statistical way, in a model, by, by modelization, by other ways, but you have to do it. Uh, so, so just to kind of, if you're doing communications, I've been doing a lot of empirical work on the news media, and I'd say that, you know, generally when you're thinking about kind of social science and discovery, there are actually a lot of different approaches that all shed light. So, I mean, I have some papers that I would think of as descriptive. So, like, you know, people read this on Facebook, and they read more on Facebook than, you know, more of this type of thing on Facebook than they do if they go to the New York Times. And of course, that's not completely causal because even though I'm, you know, maybe if I make some assumptions about the person and that the person's going to make the same preferences independent of the con, have the same preferences independent of the context, I can say something causal. But roughly, I'm describing the world. But certainly, if I know that people read a lot more polarized news off of Facebook than off of the New York Times. That's a starting point for knowing what an interesting uh, study would be that tried to get more at the, the causality. Then mm -hmm. I have another thing where like a natural experiment where Google News shuts down in Spain, then I do a difference in difference and I'm tracking people who use Google News and didn't use Google News before and after. There I've got a different set of assumptions under which in principle I'm doing causal inference, although the questions the <coughs> assumptions are somewhat strong, perhaps. And then you know you can go build, I'm working with another co-author, a computer scientist, to build a big latent variable model to try to really uncover the underlying preferences and do a sort of a more of a Bayesian style estimation of all those latent variables. In principle, though, if I do it right, I can do some counterfactual predictions about what would happen if you know the New York Times shut down. So you can take like all, you know, a some like a single problem and you know, do some descriptive, fact-based stuff, some basic prediction. You can do, you know, you can you can try to use causal natural experiment mm -hmm. techniques, mm -hmm. and all of those different techniques can enlighten a, a broader discussion. Yeah, but it shouldn't be metaphysics. Sorry? It shouldn't be metaphysics. At some point, you can have reasoning that or, or thinking that can be very subtle and that balances causal ideas and so on. 
But at some point, you end up with a question that's purely empirical. If I do this, will I observe that? Absolutely, but <laughs> yeah, if so you even pose that well, it'd be, it's useful to have so some true, true or false, yeah. Yeah, I, no, no, absolutely. So I guess my, that's my point. My ultimate goal I, as a social scientist <coughs> would be to answer a counterfactual yeah. question, but I might publish an entire paper that had nothing but facts in it, because if I don't have those facts, then I don't even know what the interesting questions are to ask. Or, 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 or even beyond that. I mean, what would have possibly a problem. I mean, certainly for knowing which questions to ask, I agree with you 100%, but even there are a lot of papers published that attempt to answer them without a true experiment. You use a lot of the techniques you just said to sort of build a, a case, and you don't have a gold standard experiment to do it, but you may have enough evidence from, from other kinds of sources that you, you move your priors. Scientific process, I want an experiment at some point. At some point? At some point. Well, uh, well you mentioned the solar mean, system. Does, does was, what was the experiment that, that, that Copernicus did? You would well, said that was a canonical example of a theory that you believed. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Um, <laughs> there was actually there was actually a couple. What's that? There was actually a couple. Um, one was the mo the motion of March, oh, sorry, the motion of Mars, mm -hmm. and uh, in the most complicated model by Tycho Brahe, yeah. they had eight minutes but zero, and Kepler wanted to fix it. I but think they, they, bo they both matched the motion. It's just that one theory oh was. Oh no, the one is better. Yeah, but, but the, the old one, but it wasn't the, the one that, that's crazy, it's not that bad. Uh, the thing is that then new planets are discovered and they still obey the rules. So that's a form of experiment. Now, you can say that uh, if you do cosmology, which is uh, discussing what's happening at the creation of the universe, it's hard to experiment with. And there is a debate in the physics community of whether this is valid or whether not. Whether real science, yeah. You see, the, so, so people uh, sometimes uh, complain about that. But right. Okay, well, sometimes it's good to manipulate ideas. I don't say that the experiment should be in every paper. Okay. But, but, but I just say that uh, uh, at some point, if you want to do science and not metaphysics, you have to go back to some experimental uh, uh, validation. So we have just a couple more minutes. Uh, let's go ahead, uh, give us your question, we'll go to Michael. I, I just want to ground this uh, discussion with a specific problem we've been working on. Uh, so if you think of either using targeting engines or recommenders, right, in advertising. Uh, it's a specific, uh, you're pushing for selection bias because you want to pick a subpopulation of interest to you. So when you pick something like this, attribution becomes very important because how effective is the campaign, right? So when you go through the process of solving this problem uh, and you try to figure out how effective it is, uh, and then you ask, but now let me parameterize it in terms of parameters, in terms of segments, right, could be, something like a age, gender, income type of, some sort of, some space of parameters. So, so that is really the type of machine learning you folks are talking about, in actually having a specific problem, you actually run an experiment, you learn, you fit some parameters, and then you want to optimize so as to achieve your, uh, maximize your causal lift, right? So if you think of a problem like this, what we discover is there's so little data, with, even with millions or tens of millions of uh, users, that statistical significance of credible intervals are very hard to come by. So given these types of problems, how have you run across these, or how are you attempting to solve these in your own work, or uh, have you come across this elsewhere? So in other words, another way of phrasing it is from the extreme of A-B testing, go to multi-arm bandits. But the multi-arm bandits don't have the rewards that they're getting are all wrong, because really uh, the rewards are not representative of genuine causal uh, lift, then the multi-arm bandit can be completely off. So uh, this type of learning, how do you handle it? Uh, I'm not even going to observation, just in terms of randomized experiments, learning could be quite hard. Anybody want to try it? Mm, I'm not sure I understand enough. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll take a step. I think, well, I mean, eventually you have to bring in some understanding, some behavioral data for this internet, right? Eventually, if you want to see, you have to understand your customers. Suppose you have some company like eBay, and you have to, you have a lot of data on the behavior of the customers, right? Of the users. I would start understanding these customers, and you, you then you probably have, can have a signals higher than just this average A-B testing on average, like revenue lift. That you kind of have to deal with with some ideas going with teachers in it, you head on, and then look at the se segmentation of your customer service and do maybe segmented market uh, A-B testing. 
Otherwise, I mean, there you have also costs of different experiments. Well, I've described having done all that you're describing, and then how you learn going forward is a challenge. It's not easy because there's a number of people you need for such studies. That's what do you mean by moving forward? Uh, maybe I didn't oh, get your question. Oh, so if you want to keep learning, let's assume I got an estimate how effective a campaign was or conversion rate. I now want to optimize for lift or improvement, right? So in other words, I have a, I fit a function. And the function says, given these parameters, here's how much of a A-B test tells me, here's how much improvement I have. I now want to reallocate my budget of advertisements across different population segments based on this information. So I'm doing an optimization, iterative optimization, right? So, and so there, it's extremely noisy. That's the point. I'm saying when you're doing are, you, are you saying there's too many parameters to fit? Yeah, Is that what you're saying? Yeah, exactly. Very many parameters, uh, more than the parameters, somehow the, the statistical significance of credible intervals are such that tens of millions of users may not be good enough. Okay. So, yeah. that's the so even with big data, the, the, pr the yeah, space the of options, I think, yeah, and, and Susan was touching on that a little bit earlier, too. That right, sparsity in big data, because you may have a lot of impressions, but the conversions are very few, so and the sparsity in big right. data is a big issue. Well, so, and then I guess one, one thing there is that when, I actually think there's more environments like that than people think of. You actually never really have enough data, and that yeah. is exactly why some theoretical mm -hmm. guidance or, you know, bringing in models or domain knowledge is really important. Combinatorics explodes really fast. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But if you know that, that these three variables should all have roughly the same effect, that's like where you can use you know, various clustering techniques to reduce the dimensionality. If the economics tell you that a certain variable should, should come in, in in a particular functional form, if you put it in the, fun the right functional form, yes, your data could eventually figure it out, but you're using up observation. So there's just a lot of ways in which I think you can reduce the dimensionality with some prior knowledge and smart reduction. Uh, I think I understand the question a bit differently. You say, uh, suppose I have a system that's, I'm not, I'm not going to have good confidence intervals. And so 95% confidence don't count on it. But I still have an effect on, let's say, ex expectation with maybe bounded moments, even though they're very large. And I can still define an iterative process, for instance, all the stochastic optimizations that's going to lead me somewhere interesting. So you can still do these things. You can still use optimization with noisy estimates and go somewhere. Now you have to be careful about the nature of the noise, mm -hmm. how you can bound these moments, mm -hmm. how you can, it's a, it's a bit tricky, but it's doable. It's doable, it just won't be as precise. Uh, and in fact, if you look- uh, That makes things worse too. <laughs> well, the, if you look at the pa first paper on bandits, the, the, the Robbins paper that doesn't say the word bandits, where yeah. he said this is the 50. simplest, yeah, yeah. 50, 50 or 51, I forgot. Yeah. The simplest problem. And there is the next year he has the paper on uh, stochastic, uh, the Robbins normal method. Yeah. And he published a little comment a couple years later saying that he believes that the Robbins normal method is the key to understand the sequential design. Yeah. All right, let, let, let's talk about that. that. Yeah. Michael's been waiting for yeah. a while, so let well, me sorry, introduce. Yeah. Just wait, the, the question, oh, okay. one, okay. one, one, one comment on okay. the fact that, that uh, a lot of the uh, uh, trade-offs that have to be made when you're uh, estimating things like rare diseases have to do with uh, more subtle loss functions than, than we ever ever think about. Yes. And, and there's a usual thing, oh, point estimate and symmetric interval, that's all we need, and it doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> give give yeah. a flesh out what you mean by a more subtle loss function uh, th th uh, with its very so asymmetric. For example, th I'm involved with uh, a, a pharma company, Biogen, on multiple sclerosis, and mm -hmm. a successful drug for sadly. Mm, right. And uh, uh, what, uh, 40,000 people in the US uh, take, took the sadly, very, very effective drug, and there are 48 cases of a very serious side effect uh, in, of the 40,000 cases. And we have thousands of possible predictive variables. So if you, if you did the typical machine learning crap. Yeah. But if it's literally <laughs> life or death. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I don't think all, I'm saying the typical yeah. mindless stuff. Yeah. So you, you have to put a lot of thought in, and also yeah. you have to put a lot of thought in what loss functions, and it's not getting a point estimate mm -hmm. of how you best predict it, but it's what is, what is the cost benefit? Yeah. And that's For those people in that function. tail, yeah. yeah. That's a different loss function. Mm -hmm. I mean, because it's the stuff for sadly really works. You're not in a wheelchair, it's by this I mean, kind of, it's kind of uh, multiple sclerosis, but it really is very, very effective. And, and, and the current regulations in the US and probably more, even more strongly in, uh, in Europe are probably a mistake. All right, let's get a quick question in. Go ahead.
Interesting question, yeah. As, as the techniques get more complicated, I guess there's more degrees of freedom for the, for the researcher, huh? I'm against Dolce. <laughs> <laughs> In your old forms. <laughs> but you're happy to practice it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just say that, that this is that's something I've been trying to work on is these systematic methods that allow you to explore the data, but you're still following the rules. And I think the disaster would be that if we used our small data econometric techniques, which involve like trying a bunch of different specifications and testing this and checking that and putting in this interaction effect and you know seeing what happens. If you have hundreds of covariates and a lot of data, you know we're going to go we're going to just garbage, but I think that actually that's not going to happen because it actually just, it, it becomes obvious, to, I think, to any practitioner when you're using very large data sets that that's just wrong, and so people will be naturally attracted to more systematic techniques, but I think there is still a problem that, you know, I'm trying to be as systematic as I can, but I don't think I've got that fixed, and you can always shop across different systematic mm -hmm. methods and so on, so. so you know, ethics and other uh, other ways we can sort of systematically for the the profession having you know a more of a norm of sharing the data and people going and replicating it is that's that right, that's right. And, and actually, and absolutely, the fact that in some sense it would be very time consuming for me to go to somebody else's data set and check every possible interaction effect, but the fact that I have systematic methods that can just you know kind of in one go explore somebody else's data set too can very quickly show that well they picked out this one effect, but you know that was very non-representative in the data set. And you can, people are much more cognizant of multiple testing ideas and so on, asking people to, to provide that type of evidence. So I actually think that in some sense, like paradoxically, like in the small data world, we all cheated all the time, but we didn't really think we were doing anything wrong because we convinced ourselves we had a theory of how we were scoring our data to find the peaks out of two. But, you know, <laughs> right. once, you're, once, you, once you're in a big data setting, you can't really fool yourself. Mm -hmm. um, in that way, and you're more attracted to systematic methods. D data takes you to self for yourself. <laughs> you Ultimately, got, scientifically, we may advance. Anyone else want to weigh in on that? I think the, the, the problem still persists, even when you have big data, because now you have more powerful machines to can automatically run a bunch of methods, too. Right? I think it's good to separate the data. I mean, the confirmative analysis terminology, I hope, will come back. We do, you can do whatever you want, culture data to death, but then you say, a clean set of data you don't touch at all, and then go in with very clear, almost like FDA, write yourself a proposal what you're going to try, and just try it on the new data. And that's, you need some ethics to keep yourself doing that. So for my project, I always tell my students, save half the data, don't touch at all. Mm -hmm. Until we really- Hold that, yeah. For, yeah but, but it's not the cross-validation that it's completely, and you do lots of things on your <laughs> training data, but uh, you, and the, the other data, if you try too many methods, become test mm -hmm. training too. So you have to yeah. keep getting new data. So we started the panel talking about machine learning and causality and, and, and experimentation. Um, uh, Leon made a, a, a statement that the, it's not real science, I think, if, unless you have a, an experiment at some point, and I just- uh, It's not me, it's Immanuel Kant. Immanuel Kant, <laughs> Leon channeling, <laughs> a, a, assuming that's a correct quote. <laughs> well, I didn't say that So way. I'm just gonna Google that, but- um, <laughs> Well, you can look at the demarcation but problem. So I, I actually, I wanted to give the, uh, the rest of the panelists, that we, we left the way I want to come back to, you, d d whether that is where we should leave it. Is, is it possible to have real science without an experiment? Everything's possible, right? I mean, this is a rare case. It's, I think it really depends. Uh, my answer would be depends, right? That sounds like sometimes. If you don't do yeah. natural experiments, then I think that's a crazy statement. Um, I mean, we have lots of very convincing um, examples of causal inference Last word? I think that the uh, uh, smoking and lung cancer is shocking in cancer. We all believe cigarette smoking is a cause of lung cancer, it increases the chance of lung cancer. But there haven't been any randomized experiments despite, despite you know, millions of dollars trying to conduct them that indicates any animal will ever get lung cancer all right. smoke a cigarette. Well, thank you to the panelists, and uh, we appreciate you all uh, sharing this with us.